algebra, algebra, this is the Arabic script. Uh, it means uh, it's Arabic for revealing what is, what is hidden. Here, if you add three to both sides of the top equation and then divide both sides of the second equation by two, you reveal that x equals two. Applied math, more broadly, is a language for describing what we know or maybe just what we think about just about anything. It's a tool. It's a tool for revealing patterns and, and forces that are sometimes hidden or unexplained. These days, I suppose I'm an activist applied mathematician, a, a radical in the, in the sense that, informed by science, I, I work to prevent incrementalism from becoming a, a virtue. For an advocacy group, a, a nonprofit, I, I research energy and water and, and climate policy. And we help people in communities organize and, and take action against corporate abuse on, on those fronts, and that's, that's radical. Racial and economic justice are preconditions, to my mind, if, if we are to meet the food and water and energy and climate challenges that we face, and that's, uh, that's somehow radical as well. Incrementalism won't necessarily get us there. If you go a third of the way to a goal and then go a third of that distance again and so on and so on, uh, you'll only get halfway. My path, my path to here and, and to now has been individualized. Uh, this, is, this is a balloon. If I were to hold it, say, at uh, zero, zero, say my, my right toe is the origin, if I were to hold it at zero, zero, it would take a path. And every atom in the balloon also follows a path. Suppose over and over again you release inflated and unclosed balloons. What do you see? What's the story with the spiraling loop-de-loops? Are they contained sometimes on the surface of a cone? These are, these are questions a kid might ask. These days now, using computers to apply math to balloon physics, you could totally simulate the evolution of just about every point, every bit of the balloon as it flies in time. A hypothetical balloon on a hypothetical flight, uh, not just the, the path of the center of the mass, but every bit of the balloon. You wouldn't need to huff and puff to inflate thousands of them. So modern computational science is, is kind of amazing, but maybe this application and these questions are not that important. Um, is that okay? Certainly it's okay for a student in the sense that they would learn a lot of computational science, working on tracking or simulating the paths of every bit of a balloon over time. But who would fund that research, and, and would a student want to be part of something bigger, possibly? At one point in my path to here to now, in graduate school, I was laboring through an article titled Electromagnetic, Electromagnetic Scattering Off of Large Objects. It was 1998, and when the Clinton and Gore administration bombed targets in Iraq that year, it occurred to me that Saddam Hussein's limo would probably qualify as a large object. Don't get me wrong, Saddam was a problem, uh, long in the making, but I became a bit wary of my, my enterprise. And for what it's worth, his limo is quite beautiful. Now, of course, we've progressed with alternative technologies, alternative technological solutions to the imaging difficulties I was looking at in 1998. We have drones that mimic big flies, carrying video cameras and maybe a bit of explosives. They observe scenes in the streets and send gigabytes to Tampa, Florida in real time. Decapitation by sword in the public square is medieval and barbaric. 
But a fly-sized drone landing on a target's head and detonating, that's a significant increment better than firing much larger missiles. Well, to what extent, to what, ex to what end does this sequence converge? When we say we're solving a problem, in what sense are we minimizing error? Over what time scale and over how large a space are we defining objectives and estimating results? And with what weights are we favoring outcomes in the process of arriving at a solution? These are all the sorts of questions I would be trained to ask as an applied mathematician. Ultimately, my PhD was on a more benign topic. Pardon me. We looked at an old question a new way. As I wrote up the lemmas and, and theorems, I looked at my personal and professional options and, and I sought new ground. I was familiar with the mathematical questions that serve the defense industry and questions that, that serve the oil and gas industry. I'd seen academic mathematics in the service of financial trading schemes and I was not personally driven to, to work on those questions. I turned to biology, it was 2001 and the human genome was being sequenced. I, I fished around on the internet and I, I managed to land a two-year gig in San Diego learning biology and applying math. The gig was thanks to taxpayers through the Department of Energy and it was thanks to the wealth accumulated by one Alfred P. Sloan. He's the chap who ran General Motors about 80 years ago, 90 years ago. He was a radical. He orchestrated the systematic dismantling of public transportation by rail in cities all across America, from Los Angeles to New York. So there I was, forced to live in San Diego, by the beach, on the public's, and on Sloan's dime, with near total autonomy to do whatever at the interface of math and biology. So talk about privilege. The proposal that got me the gig wasn't derived from questions biologists were asking, really. It was a solution in search of a problem that I'd brought. I figured I ought to work on questions from biologists and I stumbled on a pretty good one, pretty difficult one, ultimately. I spent the next nine years researching, modeling, and trying to understand stuff that seems to happen when our brains, or mouse brains, develop. It turns out that the neurons that make our brains form a mosaic. Each neuron has a varied copy, or shuffled copy, of our own individual genome. Other organs don't have quite so much genomic diversity. In those nine years, I, I built basic models for helping experimentalists think about what must be happening from the genomic to the cellular to the cerebral cortical sixth scale with the production of neurons. We looked at noise and the response to DNA damage is generating genomic diversity in an indi individual brain. And one of the aspects was the importance of the death of neurons during the development of the brain. Five of those years, I was an academic at Clemson University in Northwest, South Carolina, on John C. Calhoun's old plantation. It's a lovely place. One of Calhoun's legacies is that region is an epicenter of neo-Confederate thought. I'd done some guerrilla signing on the Iraq war, posting homemade signs with a staple gun back in the day. In Northwest South Carolina, it was my privilege to expose as many people as possible to the thought of Obama for president. People would clear the signs and I would repost them, post new ones. Obama's not a radical, but his becoming president was, for many there, and similarly, Hillary Clinton becoming president would be as well. When I met Obama one frosty morning in Spartanburg as a campaign volunteer, I told him, Clemson Math Department. He said, good, we need mathematicians. I took him at his word. A few years later, I moved to DC with my partner. We were expecting our child. And for three months, the Gulf spill spilled. Before long, I was sitting in the US Senate office as a science advisor of sorts, on my own, listening to 19 New Jersey Garden Club ladies express their concerns about hydraulic fracturing for natural gas natural gas being billed as a climate solution at the time. You've heard of it, fracking, the shale revolution. I had the sense to try, to, to not try to bluff them, and they left with their concerns mostly unanswered. That was before I'd put my thumb on the root of the issue surrounding fracking. 
I love Obama, and, and these days I'm asking him a, a, a radical question. Should we really be equating North American energy security with maximizing oil and gas production when maximizing oil and gas production flies in the face of climate science? The oil and gas industry, big banks, and think tanks think yes. In 2013 and much of 2014, piles of scientific articles were getting published on the array of impacts before, during, and in the aftermath of fracking. Impacts on air, water, climate, landscapes, and, and communities. I was prepared to read and digest the science thanks to Alfred P. Sloan and my own unique path as an applied mathematician. This synthesis argues the case for a ban on fracking. It's one, one result of that work. Espresso from this block fueled much of that writing in rewriting and re-rewriting. Espresso beans shipped to Seattle and not by sailboat. Now, Neptune, Mr. Euros, and the local family bike shop are, are added to fracking's collateral damage. They will rise again, no one was killed, but they were destroyed last week by the gas leak and explosion in, in my neighborhood. Of course, calling for a ban on fracking raises questions of oneself. How am I personally minimizing, if not eliminating, use of coal, oil, and gas in everything that I do? There are things I practice to avoid and minimize my use, but in many ways, we're locked into that use. Like everyone, my family has sunk costs and continuing to burn oil and gas in the coming years. Consider cars and, and getting around. The radical dismantling and disruption of urban transit by Alfred P. Sloan et al. still haunts us all. We need another radical disruption to meet the food, water, and climate justice challenges no longer hidden. I can appreciate complexity, but I also appreciate the power of asking for what you want not just what everyone agrees is possible. Thank you.